Welcome to the Fireside Chat with the Registrar and CEO for the College of Audiologists and Speech-Language Pathologists of Ontario for May is Speech and Hearing Month. Thank you to registrants for sending in questions and for your attendance today. My name is Dana Prucci and I'm the Director of Professional Practice and Quality Assurance. I'm excited to introduce Brian O'Reardon, the Registrar and CEO of Castlepo. A recording of today's session will be available on the Castlepo website. At the end of the session, we will have information on how to provide feedback and if you have further questions or comments. I'd now like to turn to Brian for opening remarks. Well, thank you very much, Dana. And it's uh, always an exciting time of year for the professions and for uh, those of us here at the college, May is Speech and Hearing Month. And we've done this a couple of times before and uh, uh, I've always enjoyed it. So very happy to be back to, uh, to help out with uh, this presentation today and hopefully uh, convey some information that uh, is helpful to uh, all of our registrants out there. But before I begin, uh, Dana, I was wondering if I could do a land acknowledgement, if that's okay? Okay, uh, as this event is virtual and we are not all gathered in the same space, we recognize that this land acknowledgement may not represent the lands upon which you are now. If that is the case, we ask that you take the responsibility to acknowledge the traditional territory that you are currently on. Casapo acknowledges the traditional territory of many nations, including the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Windap peoples. In addition, we also acknowledge that Ti Karanto, which is a Mohawk word meaning the land where trees stand in the water, is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. This land is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge the peoples who have, since time immemorial, cared for the lands that we now call Ontario. Thank you. Here's our first question. Now that we have two years of the COVID pandemic behind us, are there any lessons learned for the college or any advice you might have for registrants going forward? Well, thank you, Dana. Actually, uh, as I think about it, there are really some uh, silver linings, uh, believe it or not, to what has uh, happened over the past couple of years. I think we all know, uh, as much as we have all been saying, you know, we, we wanna get back to the way we were. I think we're also recognizing that there's some things that probably have changed and will continue to be part of the landscape in healthcare as we move forward. Um, one of the silver linings, I think, uh, Dana, is that uh, uh, I feel that registrants have reached out to uh, the college more than ever before regarding uh, advice about their practices. This is a good thing. Um, during the past two years, we've experienced a significant increase in practice advice inquiries from both professions. In fact, the numbers have doubled from approximately 200 a month before the pandemic um, to over 400 now. I like to think this is because registrants recognized early on that the college was a credible and reliable source for information relating to government announcements and directives concerning COVID-19. In 2020 and 2021, the college sent over 90 emails uh, to registrants uh, each year. One third to one half were pandemic related. Our COVID information web pages were established back in March of 2020 and have been very much utilized by registrants over the past two years. In addition, we have partnered with public health units in Ontario to distribute information to registrants in their districts. I also think that we have moved forward um, to a situation where now all healthcare providers, including our registrants, will be making long lasting changes in their point of care risk assessments of patients. Absolutely. Even when COVID is as gone as it will be, infection prevention and control standards and point of care risk assessments are key for all healthcare providers, especially our registrants. Some registrants reported that their PCRAs might have been informal before the pandemic. For example, an SLP picked up their student from the classroom and observed a runny nose. She knew to have extra tissues, hand sanitizers, and wipes on hand. Now, all registrants are familiar with point of care risk assessments. They will be an important part of assessments and intervention going forward. 
In addition to getting information about the patient, registrants will consider the physical environment. Are they meeting outside? Is it a hospital setting? Registrants may decide to delay intervention if that is the most appropriate clinical idea. You know, as you were um, uh, speaking there, Dana, I thought um, there's another silver lining that maybe I could talk about uh, that we've seen over the past two, two years, and that involves really how adaptable our registrants are when it comes to using virtual care. Um, and they've been using it more and more now uh, as a means of treating and reaching their patients. And I think that is going to continue. Yes, I found this true for my practice as well. Audiologists and SLPs who learn virtual care can be used in so many areas of practice. Virtual care has opened up more options for the public. For example, people with aphasia have succeeded in virtual care for therapy and conversation groups. SLPs and audiologists during the pandemic have determined how to use virtual care, maybe for case histories or follow-up, and have integrated this into their everyday practice. Virtual care is here to stay. Yeah, that's my strong feeling as well, uh, Dana, that virtual care indeed is, is very much here to stay. Uh, as a college, we recognize that registrants needed more assistance in implementing virtual care. And therefore, we move forward with a new standard uh, in this regard. And your department, of course, was very instrumental in bringing that forward. For sure. The new standard on virtual care in Ontario was approved by Council and has been in effect since September 3, 2020. The standards lay out how Castlepell audiologists and SLPs are to provide virtual care in Ontario. They go through consent, privacy and security, services and technology. There are also answers to frequently asked questions about virtual care, as well as a one page version that is written for the public. I'm gonna share my screen now so that we can look at it very quickly. So this one pager is available on the Castlepo website under resources. Talking about virtual care, we've had lots of questions from registrants over the past two years. Questions have focused on the provision by our registrants of virtual care to patients outside of Ontario. Brian, can you comment on how the college has tried to address this? Well, let me start uh, by saying, uh, Dana, that of course, um, one of the, the central obligations that we have as a college, as a regulator, is to protect the public with respect to the care provided to them by our registrants. This, of course, most of the time uh, involves the provision of care to patients residing in Ontario and often uh, providing that care in person. However, some Ontarians receive care from professionals in other provinces, and some of our registrants actually themselves provide care to patients in other parts of Canada. These situations are something that we have tried to address many times over the past two years. Uh, by taking the lead in discussions with regulatory colleges and other professions uh, and other provinces in order to find some solutions. We have now come up with a mechanism which is called the Cross-Provincial Practice, CPP, to allow audiologists and SLPs to provide care across provincial boundaries through an agreement embodied in a Memorandum of Understanding. This uh, Memorandum of Understanding with other provinces um, will facilitate uh, a number of things that registrants have asked about for many years. Um, you might have noticed, for instance, that we are circulating a change to the fees bylaw right now uh, that specify the costs for such a license in Ontario. So it is coming. Can you tell us more about how the cross-provincial practice would work exactly? Yes, um, it would allow uh, for registrants to hold a full practicing license in one participating province, let's call that the, the primary province, uh, to apply for a cross-provincial practice registration in another participating province, so let's call that the, the secondary province. In this way, registrants will not have to pay full licensing fees in the secondary prov province. And this has been one of the big barriers really to uh, facilitating care. So we now have agreement that that won't happen going forward. Um, so they won't have to pay the full licensing fees in that secondary province, uh, and they will be allowed to uh, provide a maximum of 200 hours of direct patient care uh, over a 12 month period, which can be delivered either virtually or in person. 
In addition, the agreements will allow for urgent care, uh, such as when an audiologist is asked to make an adjustment for a hearing aid for their patient while the patient is in another province. The audiologist would not need to become, in that instance, registered in with that other participating province. So the cross-provincial practice will actually allow patients to choose a service provider even if they're in another province. Although the amount of service is limited, it sounds like it definitely enhances patient choice. Uh, yes, likely it will become available uh, actually this summer. So with some very good news. So stay tuned for further communications from CASPO in this regard about how it will work, uh, how you can access it, um, uh, what other provinces are participating, and the links to those provinces for further information. Excellent, very exciting. Brian, I believe that last summer, Castle Hill provided a webinar on diversity, equity, and inclusion that was attended by over 800 registrants. Can you give us an update today on how the college is continuing its focus on DEI? Well, that's a great question, uh, Dana, and, and I think it's true um, that uh, we have certainly had a focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, I think it's safe to say, in fact, that uh, our college uh, was one of the leaders uh, amongst the regulators in Ontario in addressing DEI matters. We have continued our focus through making DEI fully a part of our new 40-year strategic plan, which has just been approved by the board of the college. And in addition to that, we have appointed the first ever uh, uh, DEI officer on staff. That officer is Priya Singh, uh, who is also our Director of Professional Conduct and General Counsel. So very busy uh, uh, workload for Priya, but uh, uh, we're very fortunate she's been able to take on these additional responsibilities. Um, we have a dedicated web page for our DEI resources, and we have conducted training sessions on DEI with both staff and board members over the last year to ensure that all of us have a good understanding of DEI related matters. In addition, peer assessors will now have DEI uh, training. Uh, they had it last year, they'll have it again uh, this year. And all regulatory colleges in Ontario are now moving forward with formal uh, DEI plans and approaches, including a focus on reviewing all documents and communications put out by the college through a DEI lens. The Ministry of Health formally commended our college, in fact, for our approach to DEI. As well, colleges must now report to the Ministry through the College Performance Measurement Framework uh, on how they are addressing DEI-related matters. Uh, additionally, Castle Poe has finalized a contract uh, just in the last uh, few weeks, actually, with a very noted uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion consultant, Dr. Nafisa Jalal. Uh, and if that name is familiar, it's because uh, Nafisa worked with us uh, last year and was involved in our DEI webinar. Among other projects uh, that Dr. Jalal will be assisting us with, I would like to mention that we will be engaging with all registrants about the collection of demographic data so that we are better able to assist registrants and serve the public. The college is collecting this information on a voluntary basis on the advice of the Government of Ontario and the Ontario Human Rights Commission, which suggests that demographic data collection should be voluntary, optional. Uh, demographic data collection supports Castle Poe's DEI uh, initiatives. The college will use this information to identify opportunities for improvement and growth, to identify gaps in our approaches. Uh, the goal is to be able to measure the extent to which the representation of the professions reflects Ontario's diversity demographically. The collection of this data on a regular basis will enable the college to monitor the changes in the professions over time and whether they are becoming more or less reflective of the population being served. The information, of course, will be anonymized and aggregated. The demographic information that registrants provide will not appear in the public register. Um, so these are just some of the things that, that we're doing, Dana. Um, and we'll continue to work on other things, such as um, the fact that we now have uh, in place, as, you, as I did at the beginning of this uh, uh, event, we now have in place an Indigenous land acknowledgement, which uh, 
uh, begins all of our uh, board meetings. And you will have seen, I think, an e-blast about resources for May, Speeches Hearing Month, that highlights our Trust Matters poster that was redesigned and translated for multiple Indigenous communities. And I believe we're the first college in Ontario to do such a thing. Um, all the agencies uh, in the Indigenous communities will now be receiving copies of the posters, so you, in fact, may see them in some of your own uh, practice environments. I hope that covers DI. It's a big area for us. It's a big area, for sure. Another question we received was from an audiologist concerning the revised audiological assessment standards of the college. He said he found the standards to be of great assistance, but they seem to be very much written for audiologists. He wanted to know how does the college make such documents accessible and understandable for the public? I'm going to share my screen while you answer just to help out a little bit. Thanks, Dana. What, what a great question. Um, because uh, I, I think the registrant is, is, um, is, is very much uh, on the mark in terms of many of our uh, documents, of course, are very technical. Um, they are very geared towards assisting um, uh, professionals to uh, provide better care, um, to guide them in how to do that, um, and to be there to answer questions on them. Um, and also, of course, to, to involve the registered base in, in the creation of the standards. But he's uh, very correct. It sometimes can be probably very daunting for patients who go to our website um, or for registrants who are trying to explain why they have to do certain things um, to comply with a certain standard. Um, so we are addressing this um, and it, we're doing it in a way that I think uh, is encapsulated or demonstrated by this uh, uh, um, the showing on the screen of uh, four patients what to expect when an audiologist tests your hearing. So we're going to continue to produce these kinds of documents uh, for the public. The documents are now easily accessible on our website under the resource section and of course to registrants who can download them and provide them directly uh, to their patients. And I wanna just take a moment to explain how we got to this stage and how we got to this approach. So um, like many colleges in Ontario, we, are, um, we avail ourselves of the services of the Citizens Advisory Group, which is composed of some 50 patients from all walks of life and all regions uh, of the province. Uh, the advisory group consists of people who have experienced care from both primary health care providers and also from rehab professionals such as our registrants. In this particular instance, the group reviewed the original practice standards on virtual care and then suggested, or on audiological assessment, and, and then suggested how they could be made uh, comprehensible to the average patient. Their input, I have to say, Dana, was really terrific. And I would note that now 21 of the 26 regulated colleges in Ontario make use of the group when developing new standards and other public facing documents. I really love these documents that are addressed to the public. Now, looking internally, we received a question concerning how newly retired registrants could continue to contribute to their profession after they have resigned from the college. Well, first of all, let me say that, you know, often we see people who are uh, resigning their uh, licenses who have uh, really dedicated all their life to uh, working with their patients, you know, 30, 35 years in the profession. And we can't thank them enough. I mean, it's just absolutely tremendous that they have that dedication. Um, and um, so I can understand how they may feel, well, why can't I continue to participate as if I am a regulated health professional? And why am I not being appreciated? But that really is not, uh, unfortunately, the, the, the situation that we can address here. Um, and we have noticed certainly um, an uptick uh, in the number of registrants uh, who are uh, leaving the profession, who are um, uh, no longer uh, renewing their licenses. And, we don't know why exactly this has happened. It, it, it may be COVID related or it may be other matters, but that is certainly happening. Um, and so I do understand the question and I do understand people who want to have that social network, who want to have that feeling of belonging and being appreciated. Um, 
But of course, such individuals can continue to stay connected with their colleagues through informal uh, platforms such as social media, chat groups, and other outlets. Uh, however, uh, I have to say, Dana, as the college's main focus is on those who are registered as professionals, we do not really provide mechanisms by which registrants can continue or former registrants can continue once resigned to make contributions to the regulatory environment. Our hands are really tied by the legislation in this regard, and I think for good reason. Um, resigning is very different from retiring or, or switching to a non-practicing status. Resigning means you're giving up your license altogether. Um, it means that uh, if you make that decision to resign from CASAPO, you in fact now become a member of the general public. Nothing wrong with that, but it's not the same as being uh, a registered professional. Um, so you're no longer really part of that, that registered group that you were just for many years before. Therefore, you cannot be a peer assessor or a member of a committee of the board. Um, you can't sit on the board of the college. And that is because the college must rely for formal input uh, to its uh, standards and procedures on those who are currently registered. After resigning, you can continue to access the college website and can sign up to receive the college newspaper, newsletter express. Um, it is important that those who choose to resign uh, do not continue to use any of the protected titles, such as audiologists, speech language pathologists, or speech therapists. The reason for this is that the legislation is very clear that only those registered and licensed by the college can use those titles. If you retire from work but wish to remain a registrant and contribute to the regulation of the professions, then I think people should consider moving to non-practicing status. Um, you can continue to use the title, but have non-practicing in brackets uh, next to it. This non-practicing category is pretty unique, actually, to CASAPO amongst uh, many of the colleges right now. I hope that explains uh, why we have to take the stance we do. Uh, it is for patient protection. It is so that there isn't confusion. Um, and I do want to, again, thank so much those who have spent so many years and given so much of their lives and service uh, to their patients. But uh, trying to continue it after, um, but after you no longer have the license just isn't possible in, in the current uh, regulatory environment. I think that really explains it. And I think what you're saying is that you can retire from your job, but not need to resign from the college. I think that's it exactly. So here's another question. An SLP registrant described how she's been working with a colleague who was internationally educated but cannot work in Ontario because she does not hold a master's degree in speech language pathology. She wanted to know if the college had any plans to recognize bachelor's degrees obtained in other jurisdictions. Well, I have to be very honest with you, uh, Dana, I don't see that that's going to happen anytime soon. Um, and that's because the, the minimum requirement uh, in Ontario and really now across Canada continues to be the master's degree. The regulators uh, decided that some years ago and it's uh, continued to be in place uh, for all uh, provinces and all um, uh, audiologists and speech language uh, pathologist uh, registration matters. Um, so again, I do not foresee that that's going to change. Um, unfortunately for individuals such as the colleague that our registrant has referenced, there are currently few opportunities for bridging programs at the academic level. Our registration team, however, does work to inform international programs that this is the requirement in Ontario and in Canada, so that people considering uh, applying uh, to us or other jurisdictions are well aware before they uh, undertake the application process. However, as you know, there is quite a bit of focus right now at the political level on the whole area of recognition of international degrees and the integration of immigrants and refugees into the Canadian workforce. CASAPO will certainly be part of those broader discussions and we'll see where they go. But right now, um, I have to say that we're not anticipating a change. CASAPO is always putting effort, however, into ensuring the application process is fair. In fact, uh, we are evaluated annually by the Office of the Fairness Commissioner of Ontario, 
who looks at not just the 26 health regulatory colleges, but some 13 or 14 uh, other regulated professions, including uh, lawyers and engineers, foresters, etc., cetera, um, to ensure that uh, what the regulators are doing is fair, impartial, objective, and transparent with respect to all internationally uh, trained applicants. We are providing webinars uh, ourselves specifically for applicants educated outside of Ontario um, uh, and outside of Canada, rather, uh, to help facilitate their application process. Currently, 20 to 30 percent of our applicants are internationally trained audiologists and speech language pathologists. So we uh, uh, certainly have a focus in that area, and it is exemplified, I think, by the fact that we're one of the few um, regulatory uh, agencies that has a dedicated uh, person on staff uh, for uh, coordinating and uh, reviewing all international uh, uh, applications. So I hope that answers the question, Dave. I think so. Another question we have received relates to peer assessments. The registrant who posed the question was interested to know why the college conducts peer assessments in addition to requiring annual self-assessments. Another great question. Um, in fact, when I first came to the uh, college some 12 years ago now as, uh, as a registrar, it's one of the questions I had. I said, well, we're doing a lot of assessments here. We're doing self-assessments, peer assessments, et cetera. And, and so I, um, uh, I took a very close look at this to try to understand the process and the value of doing both. So right now, I would say, Dana, that Castlepo, like all colleges, has to work on the assumption that all of our registrants are competent to provide care. However, we must, under the terms of the legislation, the Regulated Health Professions Act, uh, we have to provide continuing assurance to the public and the government that our registrants are competent, not only when they um, first apply, but for every year after that. So as you know, we do this in many ways, including the annual self-assessment tool, which your staff are very involved in. And the compliance rate, I'm glad to say, for our registrants is one of the highest, not only in Ontario amongst regulators, but also across the country. We have a compliance rate of over 99%, which is really spectacular. It shows a very engaged registrant base. And I really have to congratulate our registrants and, uh, and the staff for the incredible work that's done each year uh, on the self-assessment tool. But in addition, we select randomly each year a certain percentage of the registrants to undergo what is known as peer assessment, which is a longer process, more intensive process, involves a peer, um, and I think it has great value uh, for everybody. Uh, while we know that being selected, of course, can produce some anxiety and stress for the registrant, uh, peer assessment is an absolutely vital check and balance in the whole area of the assurance of professional competency. I know that your department, Dana, uh, uh, is particularly sensitive to this and because you oversee both the self-assessment and peer assessment processes. And I also know that you recently introduced uh, uh, the whole notion of virtual peer assessments. And I think we're one of the first colleges, if not the first college to, to do this. And again, it came out of uh, uh, some of our thinking around addressing COVID-19 and the situations that give rise to it in the regulatory environment. But I think you're probably more the expert in all of this than I am. So I'm gonna turn it back to you perhaps to elaborate a bit more uh, for uh, those watching uh, on how all this works. Great, thank you. The college definitely works on the assumption that all registrants are competent. Are competent. Peer assessments are a way to check in with registrants and reinforce that they're meeting the standards of practice and have an opportunity to demonstrate their knowledge, skill, and judgment. Peer assessments are actually a very supportive process. It's designed to be a conversation between peers. The college wants to see professionals do well to meet standards and wants to support those who need the help by offering remediation. This is not a punitive process. Research supports the value of external assessments as we're not as good at assessing ourselves as we think. Each year, we try to improve the program. We've made the process speak to different adult learning styles, for example, including the clinical reasoning tool discussions, which have gone very well. Feedback post-peer assessments is very positive. There have been many express articles over the years, but in the fall of 2020, there was an article about the success of virtual peer assessments. 
Castle Poe is a leader among the 26 colleges in moving to completely virtual peer assessments. Now that they're all virtual, registrants report less anxiety. There's still work to pull together their evidence, but it's easier to find time to meet virtually. Pre-pandemic, there were actually plans to consider virtual peer assessments, but COVID really forced this decision, another silver lining. With all the positive feedback by registrants, peer assessors, financial savings, and overall success, virtual peer assessments are also here to stay. So that brings us to the end of our presentation today. Please be in touch if you want to give further feedback on anything we talked about here or have more questions. As always, the practice advice team is ready to help with practice advice questions. And I'm going to pull up contact information right now. So as we wrap up, uh, Dana, thank you very much for putting that uh, uh, on the screen and thank you for uh, to you and your staff for putting this uh, uh, hopefully very informative uh, uh, discussion together. But I would emphasize that uh, it's very important to continue to be engaged with the college. Uh, we are here to assist and help. Um, and there's some uh, uh, email addresses uh, that you can uh, access easily. Uh, I think you all know and, and use uh, very much our website. Um, but I also like to draw your attention that we have a presence on, on YouTube and uh, also on Facebook. And uh, I know many of you have joined our Facebook group and you can uh, still do that. And uh, we are posting a lot of information there, uh, particularly throughout uh, May is Speech and Hearing Month. So I recommend all of those channels of communication to you. And uh, thank you again, everybody, for uh, your uh, attention, for your incredible service to the patients um, that you uh, interact with every day. Um, and thank you to uh, uh, helping us better understand what you're facing so that we could make the changes that we've made. And we've gone through some of them here today, as you know, Dana, and we'll continue to do so. Um, consultation with the registrants is absolutely vital. And um, we have such great uh, registrant base. We have such great people out there uh, doing their jobs every day in very difficult circumstances often. And we applaud that. And uh, I will continue to, to do things like uh, today to assist you in every way that we can. So thank you again. And thank you to Dana uh, and your staff and uh, look forward to doing this again next year, hopefully, when I might even have a fireplace myself, who knows? Great. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, everybody.